As a clinical clerk in his fourth year, Mike had a better opportunity to consider the direction he wanted to follow in medicine. He met more patients, heard the story of their troubles, diagnosed their ailments, and started them on the road to recovery. Most of all, he was impressed with the number of patients who were now suffering from conditions that could be traced to neglect of early symptoms, to bad health habits, or to lack of proper medical care when they were young. They often came to the clinic from five to 25 years too late. Mike wondered if working with children wasn't the way to fight all illness most effectively. The decision was clinched one night during one of those long talk fests that young professionals like because they get a chance to show off to each other. Bill Pearson was talking about how the human lifespan had been lengthened in the last 20 years. Deaths due to diseases of old age have increased simply because more people get old enough to have them nowadays. The boys discussed new victories over microbes, the wonder of penicillin, the advances in brain surgery, the vistas opened by Bogomolet's serum, and all the while, Mike reflected. Nowadays, it was more important than ever to reach old age with a healthy body. What good is it for people to live longer if they're worn out and crippled by the diseases of their youth? The thing to do was to catch the trouble in time. Catch it early. Catch it before it does lasting damage. Was this early enough? A month after graduation from medical school, Mike was on duty as an intern in pediatrics. Pediatrics, the promotion of health and the treatment of the diseases of childhood. Full-fledged doctor now, medical degree, state license, responsibility and all. But he was more than a doctor too. For little patients are the most difficult and heartbreaking patients. Mike found he had to be a psychologist, a teacher, an entertainer, and a father as well. This children's hospital was again just one part of a great medical center, supported by generous citizens to teach and to cure at the same time. This was New York Hospital. Together with the Cornell University Medical College and a number of specialized hospitals, it constituted the newest of the great medical centers. It seemed very large, until you considered the size of the community it served. A community that included thousands of underprivileged children who were deprived of fresh air and sunshine. They lacked the ordinary ammunition needed to fight disease, good food, proper living conditions play space and freedom from fear. Some of these children were able to get the medical care they needed at the hospital where Mike now worked. Its entrance was a parking lot for carriages on the days of the well baby clinics. Well babies need regular medical examinations to help them keep well. That is disease prevention. But Mike's experienced eye noticed something his student assistant had overlooked. The unmistakable signs of malnutrition. The breastfed infant boy was well enough, but here was a sick child. She and her parents needed help. She doesn't get many vegetables, does she? Have you ever talked to a member of our social service staff? Wait a minute, Dr. Kennedy will ask her to come in here. Right, doctor? Sure, Mary, we're going to find a way to make you feel better all the time. Instead of sitting around and moping, you'll want to play more with the other kids in the block. You'll like that, won't you? Your work in school will change, too, when you're feeling better. You'll see. The story is all in the case history. Father, unskilled worker, spends a third of income on rent. Six children. Medicine is more than pills and bandages. If you treat people in the hospital and send them home to starve, they'll soon be back in the hospital. That's why trained caseworkers cooperate closely with the medical staff. You come with me, Mary, and let Mother talk about food budgets and eating habits. Rosy cheeks are usually a complicated mixture of string beans, milk, and paychecks. There were plenty of really sick children, too. As an intern, Mike would often present his cases at the grand rounds, 
so that the professor and his assistant could discuss them for the benefit of the assembled staff. Mike had to have the entire case at the tip of his tongue. These were formal occasions. Very often, doctors from other cities and countries joined the audience. Mike had to know symptoms, dates, medical history, family background, the results of dozens of laboratory tests. He had to answer specific questions on all the tiny facts that make up the technical story of an illness. And then the professor checked for himself. After all, he was learning about the case and about Mike as well. As chief of the medical staff, he also had a teaching relationship with the doctors who worked in the hospital. He approved Mike's diagnosis of congenital syphilis and the steps that had been taken to treat it, but he was afraid his prognosis was too optimistic. There were indications that the infection had reached the nervous system and probably the brain. If the child did live, which was not too likely, it would be years before a complete recovery could be expected. But it was the prenatal history of this case that particularly interested the professor. Why had the mother not been examined and then treated in time? He tended to see the doomed child as another example of the tragic results of a neglected case of infectious disease. Mike was still learning, even though he was doing at the same time, and teaching a bit. Miss Brewster, the head night nurse, was an old timer. She had been nursing nearly 25 years with wide open eyes and mind. She knew her business, but Mike, as a doctor and a recent graduate, knew a few things that even she could learn. New things, like the characteristics of the penicillin he was preparing for injection. She was surprised to learn it didn't matter if the dose was too big. It wasn't like the sulfur drugs. Penicillin has no toxic effect. Large amounts can be given with perfect safety. It was a nice feeling to give something in exchange for all the help and goodwill that had been coming his way. And it was still coming, for Mike was still a student. The men who taught in the center's medical school held frequent staff seminars on special aspects of children's diseases. They might be illustrated by extraordinary cases that were in the hospital for treatment. The spasm in a case of anorexia nervosa is not something every physician gets to see in his lifetime. But that is one of the advantages of working in a teaching hospital. Because this illness has a psychic basis, it must not be discussed in the presence of the patient. But when the 13-year-old girl has been taken back to the ward, the child psychiatrist can review the details of the strange illness. The youngster wants to starve herself to death rather than face the problems of growing up. Her confusion involves many factors, some of them reaching back into early childhood. First, she must be nourished, but the real treatment will concern her mind and her attitudes toward her environment. The doctors are deeply interested, for more and more they are coming across physical illness that can only be traced to a mental source. When doctors stop learning, the saying goes, they're through being doctors. <laughs>